and that's always fun. This morning, we're in John chapter 14, so if you grab the message notes out on the table, you can get those out or just turn to John chapter 14. And I have a question for you. If you were to go to work tomorrow morning and the ownership of your company said, tomorrow is going to be your last day, there's no severance, we're really sorry, any of the pension or whatever that you had accrued, we're really sorry, we're broke, we're, we're done, but you're going to be fine. You'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. We, we've taught you well. Don't worry about it. But tomorrow's the last day and then you're done. Or if you were going to school and you got to your school and all the teachers were out in the hall and there was an announcement over the intercom that said, tomorrow will be the last day of school. The country isn't doing school anymore. The county isn't supporting us anymore. And the teachers are going to be doing something else. So you'll, you'll be all right, though. Just read, go on the Internet. You'll, you'll figure it out. Just uh, you, You'll be okay. But tomorrow is the last day of school. You know, the disciples were essentially told that by Jesus in the upper room. In so many ways, he said to them, Guys, look at my face. It's over. You're done. You're done with me. I'm going, you're staying, you'll figure it out. (laughs) You'll be okay. And look, look, even today, 2,000 years later, today, all across the world on each of the 24 time zones, we're doing it in shifts. There are worship services for 24 hours all around the world. In fact, they go on all the time, 24-7. There's worship services, Bible studies, prayer meetings, ministry opportunities, service projects, missions trips. All of these things are always happening. Besides that, there's the body of Christ that are scattered around throughout the country, throughout the world, just dropped in all these different places, being the body of Christ here on the planet. Somehow they figured it out. But Jesus essentially said to them, I'm done, I'm leaving yeah, but what about, what about if we left land and homes and, and family that we'd get a hundred times more? And he basically would say, yep, yeah, it's true, it's, it's coming. You'll be okay, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. What if you started a business and you knew you had three years, you had three years to train people and they were gonna, you were leaving, leaving the country, pulling out, no longer involved, physically, physical presence, you were gone. And you had, to, you had to train a crew to run the company. Be interesting, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Or if all the teachers left the school and just left it run by the students. Now who's going to be in charge? Now who's going to listen to who? <laughs> now who's going to mess around in class when the students are responsible for one another? Be interesting. These people were following Jesus. He basically, when they were with him, he had all the bases covered. Even if it looked like it was going crazy, they knew that ultimately it would all wrap. Jesus would, he would close the gap. He would take care of it. He was with them. They were following him, and now he was leaving. So we're in this third week of this series called How to uh, Stay Sane in a Polarized Society. In in a society where there's always sides. There's always sides. There always has to be winners and losers. There always has to be the us and the them. Everything is choosing a side. And we're in a society that sees everything through a certain lens, And in this culture, this lens has different attributes about it that everything on the other side looks like polarization. It looks like you need to have success, you need to have dominance, you need to have the upper hand, you need to have more, you need to have just what you want, things have to be going better, the chart has to be going up and to the right. You've got a society that values success and winning and being the best and having more 
and growing and achieving and accomplishing and accumulating. And of course, you know that you, know, you drive around to these smallest of towns and on the outskirts of towns, there's the storage units, right? Where we, we're, we're accumulating so much that we have to put it in storage. Having, having lived through the passing of both of my parents and the handing off of their home to the next generation of people who would live in it, um, I think that storage units should be banned from society. Or if it's in there for more than a year, it's gone. It's just they can do whatever they want to with it. Uh, I walk around my house now after going through this with my parents, and I think, oh, we don't need that. We don't need this. We definitely don't need that. Our kids are never going to want those things over there. My wife hasn't gone through it yet, so she, she just kind of looks at me. She's like, wait a minute, Jada, what, what are you doing? Like, well, you, you'll understand when you've got to go to your parents' house and look at all this stuff, but accumulation and gathering more and achieving more and accomplishing more and being more and doing more and getting more. That's what the culture is like. And we live in the culture. And so we sometimes see the world through, the, through that lens. And then Jesus comes along, and in front of the gaze of the disciples, he puts a new lens. He puts a new lens. It's a lens that is very different. It distorts the culture. It makes it look very different. In fact, it's kind of like when you put on those crazy glasses uh, sometimes at a carnival or at a theme park, they'll have these thick, these goggles that you put on and then you have to walk from one side to another and you have to stay within the parameters, right? But you're wearing these goggles, it just distorts everything. And of course, you're going in circles and you're falling over, you can hardly stand up. Why? Because it distorts the vision. And Jesus' lens, when it distorts the world's vision, all of a sudden, all this accumulation looks a little bit vain, looks a little bit useless, looks a little bit senseless. And the achieving and the, accumu and the uh, accumulating and the climbing the corporate ladder or whatever it is that we're climbing, all of a sudden it looks a little um, useless. Like, man, is this really the best use of my time? And Peter, at the end of John chapter 13 he says to, to Jesus, he says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus says, where I'm going, you can't follow now, but you will follow later. And then Peter asks this question, which will lead us into verse, chapter 14. He says, why can't I follow you? Why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Oh, foolish Peter. Peter. How ironic, right? Jesus is getting ready in mere hours to go to the cross. Leave it to Peter to say, I will lay down my life for you, Jesus. It's so classic. It's a, it's a picture right there. It's a metaphor for all of us who want to work our way into God's good graces. Work our way into our own self-esteem. Work our way into being worthy and important enough for God to pay any attention to. Peter says, Jesus, I mean, the audacity when you think about it. Peter says, Jesus, I, I'm going to lay down my life for you. <laughs> oh, how wrong. How wrong. You can't even, like, stand up for me. You can't even live for me. And he says to him, and I, I, felt, I always feel sad when I read verse 38, because I ask myself, if I were Peter, this would probably be being said about me. He says, and this is where the phrase comes from, that it's in like pop culture now, the will, will you really? This Jesus first said it, he used it here. Will you really lay down your life for me? Really, Peter? Really? No, really? Are you going to lay down your life for me? Truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you're going to disown me three times. It was already after noon. And so he's within like 18 hours of the rooster crowing, if not less than that. And he goes, dude, by tomorrow morning, you're going to deny me three times. How embarrassing. I, I probably hurt Jesus to have to tell him that. Not only are you not going to lay your life down for me, you're going to actually deny that you even know me. 
that you were even a part of this club, that you were even a part of my coterie, my circle of friends and influencers. And then you get into chapter 14. And Jesus says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Work is over after tomorrow. (laughs) School is closing. Everything you know that is normal is going away. Ever experienced that lately? There's going to be a new normal, folks. But don't let your heart be troubled. And then he says an unbelievable statement. He says, you believe in God, and that's not the unbelievable part. But then he says, believe also in me. Talk about audacity. Here's a man, Jesus, telling his followers, you have faith in Yahweh, in Jehovah, God, the creator God, almighty God. That same kind of faith put in me. What is he saying? Another time when he's claiming deity, when he's claiming divinity, he's claiming to be equal with God. You believe in God, believe also in me. Why? Why would we believe in you, Jesus? He says, my father's house has many rooms. And if that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? He must have spoken to them about this. Not the first time he talked to them about it. And if I go and if I prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. He's going to go and prepare a place. What does that mean? How many times have you seen this in an illustration or heard this in a song or maybe a lesson or a message where Jesus is there? He's there right now. Right now, he's getting things ready for us. He's building a mansion for us just over the hillside. What this actually meant was Jesus was going to the cross. He was going to the cross to die for the sins of the world and thereby prepare a place. He was preparing the way for them. He was dying for the sins of the world. And he uses this metaphor of a house, the Father's house. Uh, I remember, I forget the name of the group uh, that wrote the common, Go With Me To My Father's House. Uh, It was a song back in the 90s. It was a real catchy song. And it was a great message, My Father's House. It's a big, big house with lots and lots of room. It's a big, big table with lots and lots of food. It's a very inviting picture. And Jesus is kind of using that picture, but he's saying he's going to go and he's going to prepare a place. And this place, this preparation, was the reason why they couldn't come with him now. They couldn't come now because he was the only one that can do it. He's the only one who's going to go and prepare this place. And then he will come back. And then he says to them in verse 4, you know the way to the place where I'm going. You know the way. And he's, he's kind of mixing up his language a little bit here. He's using a lot of different uh, elements of uh, speech as he's talking to them. And Thomas, who's from Missouri, the show me state, he says this, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? We, we don't even know. Jesus, you said you're leaving. We don't even know where you're going. So therefore, logical Thomas says, Therefore, there's no way that we can know the way. And then Jesus turns it on him. And he says, I am the way. And as Eugene Peterson does it in the, in the uh, message, also the truth, also the life, also. He's not just the way, but he's also the truth and he's also the life. And over and over in the book of John... He records Jesus saying the words in Greek, ego, eimi, ego, eimi. Sometimes they would just say eimi. That means I am, I am going to the store. I am like whatever. It's just kind of the small, the informal. But when Jesus said ego, eimi, there was this emphasis on the I am nature of his statement. 
He was saying, I, exclusively, I am, and hearkening back to all the way to the beginning of Exodus, when God told Moses, tell them, I am sent you. Tell them, I am that I am. I just am. He's the first am. He's the first that ever is or was and is now and forevermore will be. He's the ego me. And Jesus says, ego me the way. I am the, um, the hadas, the way. And then the truth and then the life. Jesus literally is it. He's not like the way. He's not like the truth to be compared with it. He's not like comparing him to life. He is the way. He is truth. And he is life. Those are important statements. They're really important. In fact, I think at the end of the, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but I make these notes pages and I, I, I don't follow them very well. I'm not good at following them, but somewhere in there, I talked about the broad invitation and the narrow application of the gospel. The broad invitation is that we're all welcome. We can all come in. We can all believe in Jesus. All of us are invited. God doesn't want any to perish. He wants everyone to to come to uh, a knowledge of him and his truth. But there's only one way to get there. There's only one door. There's only one way. There's only one life, and that's through Jesus. And that's where our culture doesn't really like that part. They don't like that he's so exclusive. Like, why do you have to be so exclusive? It's not tolerant. It's not very nice. What about all the other ways? What about all the other truth? Well, there's only one way. So it's broad in its invitation, but it's very narrow in its application. Everybody's welcome to go through this door, but you got to go through this door. Like if it were door number one, door number two, or door number three. Wouldn't you want to know which door? Like, I mean, you've all seen, well, maybe you haven't. All of you my age and older have seen Let's Make a Deal. Would you take this $100 or whatever's behind curtain number one or curtain number two or curtain number three? You want to know. You, you want to know the answer. I play Wordle. How, how many of you play Wordle? Wordle. Okay, we got some Wordlers in here this morning. So I play Wordle and my, my sister, my daughter, and my wife. <laughs> That's a good, good group, isn't it? I play against them. So the four of us have this group thing they go so I'm with my wife and I'm in the living room with her she's already gotten it I'm just kind of tired I'm sitting on the couch and I'm like I've got I got uh uh, I did it look what happened my clock's gone again um oh wow here we go oh there we go there that's better there we go I've only got two lines filled and I'm tired I don't really feel like it doesn't even look like there's a word that's going to be there So I say to my wife, just tell me what it is. She's like, no. Like, hon, just tell me what it is. I'm not playing. I won't put it in the group. Just tell me what it is. I just wanted it. I wanted the answer. I wanted the word. There's only one word. The other other day it was egret. Who knows egret? E-G-R-E-T. I figured it out, but it took me all six lines to figure that one out. Sometimes you just want to know. But it's funny how there's... There's this one narrow application of the gospel. There's this one way. Well, it's like people don't want to know. No, because they don't want to be wrong. They want their, what if it's a way that they don't like? What if it's not their favorite way? What if this way doesn't fit to their liking? They want other options. They want different ways. But when I play Wordle, there's only one word for the day. It's 24 hours. And once you get that word, it's over. You're done you got to wait till mid- midnight before you can play again. My sister's on the East Coast, so she stays up until midnight, and so it's 11 here. So she does it, and she's got it a full hour before we can even start it here at midnight. So Jesus, his invitation is broad. Everybody can play, but there's only one word. Sorry, 
It's one word for the whole world for that day. There's one word for the whole world for salvation, and that is the name of Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This morning as we were praying over here at 8 o'clock, there's a good, good circle of people, a good group of people who come early to get things ready for all y'all when you come. And uh, as we were praying, one of them prayed, was thankful that somebody took the time to share the gospel with us. And of course, it transported me back to Western New York to Mrs. Bennett's house and how she shared the gospel with me and we knelt by her couch and, and, and I prayed. And I thought, yeah, as he was praying, I thought, yeah, what if, what if the person who shared the gospel with me didn't? And if you can remember, if you had a day like that when you were younger, what if the person that decided to share the truth about Jesus with you didn't? What if they didn't? That'd be weird. You'd be lost. You'd be in the dark. And I wonder this morning, with a group this size, if there are some of you maybe that have not ever believed in this one way. You've never decided, yeah, even though it's one way, I, I'm going to place my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop trying to be the Peter who is going to, I'm going to lay down my life for God. I am going to do the right thing. I'm going to live the life. I'm going to be found worthy. Maybe to just set that aside and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm a mess. I'm a wreck. I, and I don't deserve anything. But I'm coming to you today by faith. I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to believe in the way. Oh my goodness, we get to know what it is. It's Jesus Christ. The way, the truth, and the life. We can know the answer to that question. We, we know the word. We don't have to do six tries on our iPhones or our Androids. We already know. The word is Jesus. Five letters. It even works with Wordle. <laughs> Jesus is the word, and he is the word. Have you trusted in Jesus I mean, really, really. At the end of the service this morning, somebody came up to pray at the front, and I prayed with them, and their cancer is back. Um, I guess you could know this. Chris Simbro. Chris and Sandy were here this morning. Chris had some melanoma three years ago that was removed, and it's back. And he's... He's a worrier. This is a good thing to worry about, right? So pray for Chris. Pray for Chris. Pray that he be healed from this cancer. But we talked about what is it like? What is it like when God is the only one you can trust? Because all of your other options have depleted. Like when cancer comes in, and if it's like running amok and we don't know that it is, hopefully it's not. There's no reason to think it is, but it's melanoma. It's a little bit, and they've got to deal with it. But who do you trust? You trust the doctors? You can't trust even your own body? You don't know what the future brings? And, and, and all of a sudden, and I've only, honestly, I've only two, really two times in my life have I ever ha had to come before God and just completely trust God. The trust fall, you know? Only two times. I mean, I know we're supposed to trust God every day, right? Every day, but we've got enough money in our bank account to pay our bills, and we've got enough food in our cupboard to feed ourselves. We've got clothes in the closet, right? But when you have nothing, and you're looking into the abyss, and all you can do is trust God. So I'm asking you, have you really trusted Jesus? Do you trust him with your future? Do you trust him to forgive your sins, to cleanse you from sin, and to give you his righteousness? Have you placed your faith in him? So that if you were standing at the edge, and you knew 
tomorrow's my last day, and then I'm going to face eternity. Would you have confidence? Jesus said, go away me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, no one, this is the exclusivity here, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, can you really take us to the Father? Look at what he says. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip, who was daydreaming at Jesus' last statement, says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. It's not going to be enough. It's never enough. When your kids are like, just one more and then we promise we'll X, Y, Z. Do what you want us to do. No, just one more. Look, do it now. Do it now. One more isn't going to help your obedience. You just got to do it. Not that I've ever been around any kids who disobeyed before. Um, Philip, it ain't going to be enough. It's not going to be enough. You got to believe. He says, don't, but then he says, he says, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Really, Jesus? I must not have been paying attention during that lesson. If we've seen you, we've seen the Father. Another statement. He's, he's, it's, a, it's an equivalent here. Me, the Father. <laughs> the Father's up high, and there I am. Me and the Father. Me and the Father are, we're one. We're one. And then he says, don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? And the words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. He, I do what he wants me to do. I say what he wants me to say. So believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Wow. Those are big words by Jesus. What does that mean? It means that God has come. That the creator, God, has come. He was here in the flesh like us. He was here. And he's proclaimed himself to be the way and the truth and the life. I've got a lot of other stuff that I had said before and in the first service, but we're done. <laughs> it's 11.28. But I want to ask you a question, those of you who have been believer for a long time. What do you need to just trust God in? Because at the intersection of our faith in this issue called security, that the world tells you that you need insurance and savings and position and power and influence and popularity and all this stuff in order to be secure. In the kingdom, the influence of faith and security is this thing called trust. You just trust God. Chris and I talked and prayed together this morning. And he knows that. He just has to trust God. And when God is the all you can trust and the only one you can trust, that's not a bad place to be. And is God the one you're trusting this morning? Maybe you've been a Christian for 50 years, but you're facing some difficult things right now whether it's health or family and relationships or property or employment or finances. And maybe you just need to hear this morning, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe. Just believe. Trust in God and trust in me. Trust me. And my goodness, he goes on from chapter 14. He says so much more that we're going to look at. There's so much more that he says that all connects to this. But whether you've been a Christian for 50 years or five minutes, Jesus is all we have. He's all we need. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And it's wonderful. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for that one here this morning or two or more, maybe many that have never placed their faith in you before. And this morning, Lord Jesus, you proclaim yourself to be the way and the truth and the life and the only way to the Father. 
God, again this morning, I place my faith in you. I trust you, Lord Jesus. I believe you, Lord Jesus. Lord, you know that when I was a kid, I got saved over and over. In my bed at night, I would call out to you over and over. I didn't need to, but I did. But today, I call out to you out of confidence and faith and trust. I call out to you as my Savior, my King. And I pray for any here this morning who have never placed their faith in you, that they would place their faith in you, Lord Jesus, and only you, not in themselves, not in their, on their performance, not in their behavior, not in their attitude, but just in you, Lord Jesus, the one who died on the cross, was buried, was raised again the third day, paying for our sin and defeating sin and death and hell and Satan and rising to sit at the right hand of God and also be within us through your spirit. God, this week I pray that you would help us to be the church, to be followers who follow you and lead others, lead others to you, that we would show the way. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.